The wage gap and other issues surrounding gender and employment have been significant in this election cycle. And yes, if you believe that your working mother, wife, sister, or daughter deserves equal pay, join us! But what exactly causes that wage gap turns out to be kind of complicated. There's actually a lot more to it than employers simply deciding not to pay their female employees as much. Which is not to say that this is not happening and that it's not a factor, but it's certainly not the only factor, and getting to real solutions requires a more comprehensive look at the causes of this problem. It's also important to note at the outset that I'm about to discuss two studies that are not particularly intersectional in their approach. These studies are dealing with gender as the singular issue and are also pretty heteronormative in their discussion, and while there is some merit to that from a research design perspective, it is also important to acknowledge that this is just one small part of the larger wage gap conversation. A recent study by Olaf Sorensen and Michael S. Dahl found that dual income couples made relocation decisions that disproportionately weighted male earnings potential over female earnings potential. That is, couples in the study chose locations with higher expected earnings for men than for women. They estimate that this mismatching of female wage earners to potential employers could account for as much as 36% of the wage gap. And this is not just a matter of income maximization, because the pattern persists even where the losses sustained by the female earners Earner exceed the gains of the male earner. And this asymmetry in the weighting of each partner's potential earnings was greatest for couples whose parents had high levels of income asymmetry. As is often the case, people are largely replicating a social order that they learned from their parents. Unsurprisingly, this asymmetry was greatest among couples with children, particularly preschool-aged children. Even among dual-income couples, women are doing a majority of the housework and the child-rearing. This is important both in terms of the way that it affects the couple's decision-making, but also in the ways that it can potentially affect the employer's decision-making. Even in households that share child-rearing responsibilities, if employers expect mothers might reduce their effort at work, they may pass over them in promotions and pay raises. The article describes this phenomenon as a motherhood penalty. The study excluded couples in which the woman did not maintain full-time employment, which again emphasizes that this is not rooted in some purely rational desire for income maximization. This emphasis on the motherhood penalty is a useful point of transition into another study by Claudia Golden, who has done a ton of work on the wage gap, and Lawrence F. Katz. This study was a little bit different. They studied pharmacy as a profession, concluding that it has become probably the most egalitarian of all professions in the United States. From 1970 to 2010, pharmacy went from being a high gap profession to one with a very low gap, roughly 92%. In that time period, it also became a majority female profession, while also seeing its median earnings rise with respect to some other high-paying professions like physicians, veterinarians, and lawyers. The core of their finding as to what exactly caused this is that the structure of this high-skill profession shifted to allow its employees to become much more interchangeable and allow schedules to be more flexible as a result. People's hours became far less rigid without depressing their wages. It's certainly not clear that you could apply this same structural shift to every profession. Each profession is unique, has its own special challenges, and its own reasons that might require a task to be performed by a specific person. That said, the larger picture of making work more flexible is instructive. To the degree that employees themselves can't be interchangeable, perhaps their hours still can be. Encouraging more flexible work structures could likely mitigate a great number of factors that contribute to inequality. And I'm just bringing that study and that idea up is just one piece of a larger puzzle of solutions to this problem. Taking steps towards universal access to quality childcare could also do a great deal of good. There's also this big cultural thing that needs to happen if we're going to address this, and that is de-gendering housework and childcare responsibilities. And that's the sort of big thing that requires all the parts of society to kind of chip in to make it happen. There are definitely some great policy level solutions, like general parental leave in lieu of maternity leave, though here in the US we don't even have guaranteed paid maternity leave, so you know, that's step one. Or rather, step one is to just go directly into guaranteed paid parental leave. It's also very much about the way that we frame these conversations. Things like describing a father taking care of his child as babysitting as opposed to, you know, parenting. That stuff is a lot harder, partially because we learn to do that in very insidious ways, and also because it has a sort of helpless I'm just one person kind of feel to it. But going back to that relocation study, couples whose parents had high levels of asymmetry were more likely to reproduce that asymmetry. Individual level choices do have real consequences. And what's more, those consequences and the sort of broader societal attitudes that they are contributing to are also going to affect the kinds of policy that we can advocate for. If you're socialized into the belief that a father caring for his child is just babysitting, then you're going to have a hard time seeing the merit in paternity leave. As a final point, I just want to reiterate that a lot is being left out by the lack of intersectionality in this conversation. This was just one set of factors, or factor, singular really, uh, for us to consider when we have these conversations and when we decide what is the best way for us to go forward? And I will leave it at that. I would love to hear your thoughts on this and have this conversation with you further down in the comments. 
all excited to cast my first ballot, and then I discovered that Missouri is not a same-day registration state. 